and say thank you to Jerry Cruz of Stogie Review thank you, Jerry. once again. Thank you, Jerry. Here, here. For making possible the production of uh, the ongoing series uh, we, we call Draper Dialogues, where we talk to the most interesting and compelling people in the business. Today, you'll have to do. <laughs> You guys are going to have to suffer along uh, right. the next we, 30 seconds. You know, in the year or so we've been doing this, we, we talked with the guy that I call the living link to the golden age of Havana cigars, Benamin Menendez. Uh, we had the, uh, the whiz kid of the tobacco patch, um, Ernesto Carrillo, and his next generation, Ernie, was here as well. That was terrific. Um, we had the, uh, the guy who's the poster boy for the cigar boom of the 90s, Lito Gomez, who's the guy that, that breaks with all the tradition, you know, he's not, not telling you that he's Cuban and comes from 15 generations of tobacco farmers and everything else, he's, he's the all new guy. Uh, of course we had the, uh, one, of the, one of the really great gentlemen of the cigar business whose family tree is literally the history of the cigar industry in the Dominican Republic, Guillermo Leon. He was very gracious and uh, uh, soft-spoken, uh, but it was a terrific afternoon. And then we had uh, the bad boy of the new age of uh, cigar makers, you know, uh, uh, Pete, Pete Johnson, who sort of left this. He's like the prow of the boat sailing through the market now, and in his wake are all these people who are, you know, trying to learn his lessons. And of course, we had the queen of the cigar business, Cynthia Puente, who was really, she's, she's beautiful and she was gracious and, and, and really passionate and articulate that day. It was, it was really great. Did I mention she's beautiful? You gotta get that in. You but can't so tell us enough because she, was, she is. She was awesome. So now we have uh, a little break with all of that just cigar business and we have uh, a guy who's like uh, a pillar of the, the, the essence of the accessory business. Um, and Danny Marshall is a, or Daniel, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll do it the right way. Daniel Marshall is the, is the classic American success story in the Horatio Alger vein. Th this, is, this is a guy who, who's actually, uh, your involvement with the business way predates the, uh, the cigar boom of the 90s. But, but this is no joke. I'm gonna tell you something that most people don't know. Danny was essentially a surf bum who was literally trying to, to build a boat to sail around the world to like bail out on the rat race. He was, he was like, I'm done with all this. The name of the boat was Breakaway. So right. that says so it right that, there. Exactly. <laughs> and and uh, so, so here's, a, here's a, a young man who has made, pursuing his passion blossom into a real livelihood which is now an international empire. And, and it has spawned organically, obviously, a cigar business which has grown, and we're gonna talk a little later about sort of the newest addition to that formula, but I wanna go back to the, the time when you were literally a kid on the beach trying to build a boat. What was the thing, what, 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 it, what happened that, that changed your life? Well, and I, time's up, next question. <laughs> exactly, we can skip over all that. Right. No, I think uh, my father took me sailing to Tahiti when I was 10 years old on a 40-foot sailboat. So we, I just love nature. I love the sea and sailing and all that. So uh, on that trip, I said, I want to be the first guy to build his own boat and sail around the world. And one of my heroes was uh, Robin Lee Graham, and he circumnavigated the globe, but his father gave him the boat. My dad wasn't giving me anything. So Except said, advice. Uh, yes, and the wrong advice, which thank God was the right advice because he told me not to be in the cigar business and not to start my business, and I, of course, did exactly the opposite. So that was the good advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I, um, so I had this dream to sit, start saving money to, to buy a boat, and uh, I, I fell in love with a boat called the West Sail 32, which is a 40-foot overall uh, fiberglass cruising yacht and you at that time you had the ability to buy just the the hull with nothing inside there was no uh, lead in the keel no bulkheads no no cabin sole no rigging nothing so just an empty whale and a dream and uh, and so I would I would save money mow lawns wash cars to tutoring everything possible work for my father for five bucks an hour and I saved I would buy gold coins 
at around $200 an ounce, and I thought that that was a good investment because my father was one of those guys that thought the world was going to end tomorrow. So you got to buy gold coins. And, uh, but, but something in the gold was beautiful and I loved to acquire it. So I bought five gold coins over five or six years. And luckily enough, 1980 comes along. I was graduating high school and the gold is at 900 an ounce. So it was perfect timing. I found the boat, my dream boat, the West Hill 32, sold the gold coins, gave the guy 5,000, chiseled him down to 10,000 for the boat and he carried a, a personal note for 5,000 bucks for two years. And I, I was started with my dream. Yeah. And, uh, and, but I had no idea how to make boats. <laughs> and uh, I was a model maker, so I knew I could, if I can imagine it, I can make it. And I imagined the boat, but I needed to know the right materials to use, the right technology, et cetera, et cetera, and also get plugged into the lowest prices to buy all the purchasing for the sailboat. Stainless steel screws are very expensive. So I worked in a marine store. And then I met the guys that work on boats, and we were, they were commissioning boats from China, from Taiwan, from um, Norway, from the Swan, the Natours. And uh, the first boat I worked on, funny enough, was Sylvester Stallone's boat, Nighthawk. He, was, he bought it to promote the movie, had a big black sail. Yeah. I'll never forget this story. When my first day's work, Terry said, go down to the Sly's boat and build him a TV enclosure. So 7 o'clock in the morning, I slide the... Uh, you know, the, the uh, cabin door open, walk down there, and everybody's in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who was back there, but I know he was back there. And uh, so I immediately left and, and went out and came back later in the day. And, um, but that was my first experience, and the guys taught me, you know, I learned so much about the process, read a bunch of books on boat building. And through this time, I was dating a girl, and her grandfather built a big insurance company, um, called Pennsylvania Life Insurance Company, and he lived in Bel Air next to Ronald Reagan and all this stuff. So I was this surfer boy, very poor guy, dating a American princess, and uh, it was kind of a funny, funny combination to see if you can imagine. Yeah. But the old man, we called him Papa Joe, thought I was crazy, and he, he just said, "This guy has a dream." So when he's, we were sitting down at a Hanukkah party uh, at his house outside by the pool, he said, "Danny." What's going on with the boat? I says, well, next week I'm going to borrow 15,000 bucks from the bank and, uh, and put it in the water, put, buy the rigging. I was going to use it to buy the rigging and uh, you know, the hit, some of the hardware for the outside of the boat. And he says, no, you got to borrow the money from me uh, because you don't want to lose your boat. If you don't make a payment, the bank is going to take it. But I'm not going to take it if you miss a payment. It's, it's OK. But I said, that's exactly why I don't want to borrow money from you, because this could be related to your granddaughter and I don't want any personal strings, and no, no, no. So for 30 minutes, we're arguing about if I'm going to borrow money from him. And finally, he said, you know what? How much are you going to need? I said, 15. He says, you're going to need $50,000, so call my secretary in the morning, and, uh, and, and she'll give you a check. And I, I mean, 50000 back then, I can live the rest of my life on 50000 That was a, a real fortune. A fortune. And, and I drove home that night knowing my life had just changed. I don't know why, I don't know how, but I knew that something pivotal happened that moment. And I wanted to make him a thank you gift. He, he could buy anything he wants, so I have to make him something. And I took some teak wood and I routed out three slots in it for his, guess what he loved most? Cigars. Cigars, smoking cigars. And when I was talking to him by the pool with the view of LA below us, he was smoking a Dunhill Monte Cruz number 280, which is a long panatella sized cigar, about seven inches long. Yep. And I went to Dunhill, bought the cigars, made this little case that hinged open very cleverly that I'd never seen before, had a hinge and a little closure on the front, put his plate on the bottom, thank you, Papa Joe, love Danny. And I gave it to him two weeks later. And I never forget my father, when he saw me working on this, he knew I'd, the guy was going to loan me money, and he says, why are you working so long on that, that thank you gift? I says, well, because that's, that's what I want to do. And he says, no, 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 you should get right to work on the boat and you're going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So right away, my father was trying Wrong. to derail the whole Wrong operation. Again. I give him the case two weeks later at his house. He said, this is fantastic. I'm going to use it on the golf course. It's so cool, so unique, and I've never seen anything like it. But you are going to take it to Dunhill tomorrow, if you want, and they will buy it. They will buy it. You can set up a little factory and make these things, pay me back. 
and sail around the world, have it all. And I've never had anybody in my life that sort of kind of encouraged me that, that a dream like that could exist. And so this is a man I, I admired and respected. He was a mentor. And it really, I'm just shaking my head. And, and there was no way I wasn't going to do, I was going to do just that. So I went down to Dunhill, showed it to a guy called Bruce Blumquist, the manager on Rodeo Drive. Yeah. And uh, he said, this is nice, but the buyer's in New York. Is this enough of this story? No, no, keep going. <laughs> keep going. This is because this is the genesis of the whole deal. So I, uh, I, my brother was living in New York at the time in a, a small studio apartment, Upper East Side. He said, hey, Ken, can I come over and hang there? I got I to gotta go see Dunhill. And of course, the, guy, the manager gave me uh, the buyer's name, but I couldn't get an appointment. He, he was, the, the, the line was, we're not seeing any vendors, yeah. no new vendors, end of the story. And so I'm, I go to my brother's apartment. I sleep on the floor. I say, hey, Ken, where am I going to hang? Where's my bed? He says, your bed's right there. But I said, but the snake is right there. I can't sleep by the snake. <laughs> Big boa constrictor in a glass case. So I, I was uh, inspired to get out the next morning, get onto the streets of New York, where the real snakes were. <laughs> right. Exactly. And uh, I still couldn't get an appointment. So I just said, OK, what the hell? I got to dress, g go down there, get dressed in the rain and knock on the door. So I did that, and Susan Trevally was the president's assistant. She opened the door, and I, I must have reminded her of her favorite animal, which was a dog, I tell you. I was wet, I had long blonde hair to here, and I had this, this case of all these cigar carcasses. And uh, <laughs> he, she begged the buyer to see me for five minutes, and his name was Carl Barbado. And I never forget sitting in his office, showing him the cases, and he was not impressed. The guy, I could tell he was like, Mm, okay. Because their stock and like, trade was snobby. How soon can I get rid of this guy? And, uh, but he did say one important question. That's right. And I think because I answered it with true honesty and directness, uh, it carried the day and made it possible for me to enter the cigar business. But he said, so this is nice, this is interesting, but can you make a cigar humidor? And I says, of course I can make a cigar humidor. What's a cigar humidor? Yeah. And, uh, you know, he didn't miss a beat. I think because I was like up frank with him, because what, I mean, you know, how many 18 year olds back in the 80s know what a cigar humidor is? And, uh, and he says, let me get one that uh, came from France and um, it had a cognac bottle in it. He says, it's broken. We've been looking for an American supplier to service them, to repair them, so we can squeeze them also on price. And because the French don't care, they, they come over damaged, they say, it's your problem. So there was, there was kind of like a need for someone in America to service that business. And mind you, at that time, there were two pl three places to buy humidor. There was Davidoff, there was Nat Sherman, and Dunhill. Yep. Basically, in the entire country, high, like luxury kind of humidors. Furniture, not... Smokers, not a, furniture. Yeah. Uh, there was, uh, but, but that was it. And there really wasn't a market for the less expensive one. It's either you had a beautiful humidor or you didn't have a humidor. And, um, and so... He gave me the humidor. He says, if you can copy this and it looks good, I give you an order. So he really probably didn't think I was coming back. But two weeks later, I came back with a copy, took the hinges off one, put it on another. And I worked in my workshop, replicated it. And uh, I, I never forget it. I just showed it to him. He says, this is nice. This is great. I had all the wood samples there. He chose the woods. He took out his spreadsheet, had 12 stores, five, six, all in like eight sizes. It was a $250,000 order I got. And I had no factory, I had nothing, but he must have known that it was gonna come through. And, uh, and I went home and showed it to Papa Joe, and he says, my God, this surfer with a surfboard on his back comes back with an order from my favorite luxury men's store. And uh, we, there's only one thing to do, we have to set up a factory. <laughs> So we spent about 200000 buying the best equipment. He believed in no, no compromise. Whatever we needed, the best sanding machines, the best planers, the best table saws. And uh, then I hired about 15 guys, uh, the best carpenters that I could find. And um, it, 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 we started making the Dunhill Humidor. And three months later, I learned a very important thing about business. And I never thought it could happen, but I got a call from this buyer. And he says, Danny, I have some bad news. He says, what, Carl? What could be bad? We're almost halfway through with your humidor order. He says, I have to cancel your humidor order. I says, cancel it? What do you mean? We just spent a quarter million dollars, and we're running and making and spraying in the spray booth. We got all these guys. 
And he says, well, London is so upset with me because I took liberty. I mean, this is, I think some things never die. <laughs> and uh, they t I took the liberty to find a supplier, approve you for the, cr uh, you know, Alfred Dunhill quality. We are purveyors to the crown and all this crap. And uh, if you want the order, if you want our business, you have to go to London. to London. You have to get approved by those guys. So I packed up my bag, took, put them all, all my six humidors in metal cases, went to Europe for the first time in my life. And, uh, and I show up at Dunhill Pipes. There's about eight guys around a table, very intimidating. They immediately offered me a Cuban cigar. I thought they were trying to get me stoned. They said, no. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I showed them the humidors, and of course, they're all shaking their heads, saying, oh, oh, I'm sorry, but you're just going to have to go back to California. Uh, and they could not wait to tell the buyer that that guy is not going to cut the mustard. But I said, before I left, I said, OK, you guys complained to me. Let's, let's write down the list. Tell me what's wrong with the box. So I tell you, you wouldn't believe how minuscule the, the problems they were looking at, the felt on the bottom had a slight wrinkle in it. There was a little compound in the keyway where the key goes. The, the screws weren't lined up perfectly so where the, the screw the heads, heads. The heads, yeah, the heads the same have way. to all be angled properly. I said, wow, those are really important uh, problems. And uh, if I can come back tomorrow with a couple of these boxes with those corrections made, will you see me? And again, they're laughing and didn't think it would happen. I go to the hardware store in London across from my hotel, fix the boxes, go back, and they're sitting there, and I, they had nothing to say. They said, I said, is this, this acceptable downhill quality? Because I'll make all the boxes to that standard. And they said, that's it. But if you don't, they're all coming back to you. So don't be surprised. And, uh, and then, um, then they gave me an order at a much less price than New York was paying me. But I was back in business with Alfred Dunhill, my dream. And, uh, and it's a funny story because a guy drove me up there, an English guy called Rod Bain. And he took me under his wing in London and helped me make appointments with Mappin and Webb and Harrods and Garage and Asprey. And I, I wanted to cover all the ground while I was there. And, um, and he said, I got in the car. And he says, I know, Danny, how the meeting went. I says, how do you know how the meeting went? You were sitting out here in the car. He says, no, I wasn't. I was in the men's bathroom in the stall hiding because after every British meeting, all the guys come in the bathroom, why they take a leak, and, and they say what the, en uh, what the end of the meeting is all about. So he, I had him write down on stationery what the guy said. And Aubrey Stiles, this old guy who ran Dunhill, Dunhill pipes. pipes with an iron fist, yeah. he said, he said any, any man that will go to his hotel room and work on our humidors is the guy it's going to make our humidors in the United States. So that, that started it. And um, then I went to New York and sold to Nat Sherman. And that's when I met George Brightman. Right at that time, 30 years ago, it's our 30th anniversary.